What's going on, reloaders? Welcome to another edition of Ranger Fieldcraft. This is the part two follow-up video to my do-it-yourself annealer video that hundreds of you guys have built and looks like you've had some pretty good success with. So there were a lot of uh, build and troubleshooting questions in the comments, so I'm going to clarify some things and share some tips and tricks that I've learned over the past two years of using this setup. I'm going to cover a few things in this video. Troubleshooting long anneal times, the unit tripping the auto shutoff switch from overheating, how to make coils to fit your brass perfectly. Uh, we even try a double coil, adequate cooling, and some other tips. Then to finish up, we will show you some results while loading on the hydro press and results on the lab radar. The most common problem people are having are long anneal times, and that's pretty easy to fix. It most likely has something to do with the coil itself. Either the coil is too big, not enough coils, your spacing's off, or any combination of those. Now, I have tried a lot of different coils, and I'm going to show you what works and what doesn't. Okay, so here we have the same standard size coil that comes in the kit with your annealer, and this is what I think most of you guys are probably doing right off the bat, and you'll see that it just takes entirely too long to anneal a single case, roughly 13 seconds. Here it is with the coil wound a little bit tighter around that case, and you can already see how much faster it's going. This one takes about six seconds. I would recommend cannibalizing these things and using them to uh, make them your own. This little black sheath part uh, slips right off. And then I don't really like this white uh, heat shield that's on the wire. You get these things hot enough to where what it does, it, it just starts drying out and gets real brittle and you end up with just this real flaky kind of just kind of breaks off and makes a mess it's really only there i think just to keep the coils from touching so if you can accomplish that without having this sheath on there it's going to be uh, much cleaner and it's not going to stink as bad when this thing starts cooking now let me show you the coil that I use the most. This is one that I wound myself, and it gets the lion's share of the tasks done around here. As you can see, it takes about one second to anneal a 223 case. This might be a little fast for some of you guys, and you can certainly uh, widen that coil out, make it a little bit bigger, and it will slow down that annealing time. The problem with not enough coils is you don't really get deep enough on the case to anneal as much as that case neck and shoulder as you'd like to. Of course you could spread the coils out and that does seem to work but I haven't experimented enough with it to say one way or the other. I prefer six or seven coils spread out from the top of the case neck down through the shoulder. So I've tried some of these thicker gauge wires and they will work but I just wasn't getting the speed I wanted from it. They also take longer to cool off and my fans were not keeping up with the heat generated so I opted for the thinner wires. The wire that comes in the kit is 10 gauge and I think that's a really nice sweet spot. However, I have been using 12 gauge for the past year and a half and it works great too. I haven't really seen much difference between these two gauge wires but they do seem to be the best. For the wire in the kit, you will need to resize the coils. The diameter of your coil is directly related to your anneal times. So, uh, you will want to rewrap these coils a little bit tighter, and you will watch your anneal times get to under 2 seconds per case. Okay, so while we're talking about coils, I've had some guys ask, you know, how long do coils last? Do they burn out? Well, I'll tell you, this coil I've got a couple thousand rounds through, and it's still working. I still use it. I haven't actually burned out a coil. I don't, they don't get that hot, right? You will see it start to glow once you get several cases into it, you know, 30, 40, depending on how long your kneel times are. Uh, you will see it start to glow, right? It gets red. When it does that, you'll notice it start to change colors and it'll start flaking off this little black carbon looking stuff. I don't know what that is, but I don't really care either. All I know is it works, it still works. I do have a backup coil if I need it. I haven't had to use it. I've had this thing spun up for uh, over a year and it just sits in my, my bin. So to answer your question, I don't know how long these coils last. Mine have lasted a year and a half and still going strong. 
So I'll let you know. Because this unit has the auto shutoff switch, I was thinking if I could get the coil far enough away from the unit, maybe some of that heat wouldn't transfer to the internals, causing it to switch off. So I tried one with extra long uh, wires on it to see if that was the case. It turns out it, it does work with longer wires like that, but the internals of the annealer still get hot independently. So it didn't really buy me any more time or work capacity. I know what you've been thinking. If one coil works, then two would be twice as fast, right? Well, it was worth a shot. I tried to get both coils as identical as I could, and it just didn't work out. All right, the easiest way to perfectly size your coils is with a set of deep sockets. I use 8mm for my 223, and it works out perfectly, right? Uh, just wrap the coil around the socket to get your size, and it ends up giving you perfect clearance uh, around that casing. I just go up to 9mm for that 308, right? Gives you the same kind of clearance around there. And then even all the way up to uh, 300 Norma, I'm just using a, a 10 millimeter socket. And it seems to fit just how we need it to uh, for the right amount of clearance. Okay, let's say you got done wrapping your coil and it looks sloppy, right? You want to have nice concentric, evenly spaced coils. And this copper wire has a little bit of spring back, right? So you can't exactly just squish it together and expect it all to stick. So what you can do is whenever this wire does get superheated, it does soften up quite a bit, right? And it makes it a lot easier to, to mold. So what I'll do is I'll just put it inside the annealer right? and then uh, just turn it on, right? And get that coil hot. So you see how it's already starting to change colors, giving a little silver tint to it. All right, so once it starts to glow, you've obviously gone far enough. All right, now if you look at the color of that, that copper wire, it's all gray. Now it's gonna be really easy to form. So I'm gonna let that cool off and I'll show you what I mean. All right, so this coil has cooled off enough, and you can see this this little silver color on here. This is the stuff that that wipes off, giving it that strange color. So obviously you're burning something out of the copper, but regardless, it does make it a lot easier to work with, right? So you can just put it back on your coil, and now whenever you tighten everything up, it actually wants to stay put. Right. So you can start with a nice tight coil and then just pull it apart so that none of the toils or coils are touching and you're good to go. Now you've got a perfectly spaced, nice concentric coil. As far as determining anneal times, you're looking for that same deep red glow as you would with flame annealing. What I do is I turn the lights down low and uh, as soon as I see that glow, that's my time. I will point out the obvious here and tell you that every brand of brass does anneal differently so each brand is going to need its own time. Now watch what happens in these next few cases. I had a piece of Lake City brass get in with my Lapua and it clearly stood out. Okay let's talk about runtime and keeping this unit cooled off. Uh, the way I have it built the internal fan only runs while you're actually annealing and it can't keep up with the heat being generated. So eventually you're gonna trip the overheat switch. You can obviously make this your own and hook up some liquid cooled coils or rewire the fan so it's always on, but that's only gonna take you so far. The internal guts are what gets hot and triggers the shutoff. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is add a desktop fan. It cools the coils, the brass, and pushes a bit more air through the unit. This will buy you some extra runtime, but again, it will only take you so far. Let me show you what I did that made the difference. 
Since the internals are what I'm trying to keep cool, I needed to pull more air through those parts. I bought this little computer blower fan and I was just gonna glue it to the back of the annealer, but as you can see, I got the wrong size. Uh, so, lucky for me, I've got a 3D printer. All right, so all I did was uh, design this little adapter bracket, put the fan on it. Now I can hook it up, slide it on the back, plug it in, and it works as intended. Obviously, save yourself the trouble and just go get you a fan that fits. But ever since I have been running this fan, I have not had it overheat yet. I think this has been the big difference maker and it has allowed me to anneal hundreds of cases in one sitting. If you can't keep this unit cooled off, it will uh, trip that auto shutoff switch on you. And you're either gonna have to wait for 30 minutes or an hour or whatever it takes for this thing to get back down to room temperature or shop vac it. All right, here's your life hack for the day. Uh, just take that shop vac hose, all right, pull it to the back of the unit and turn it off about 30 seconds or a minute and you're gonna suck enough cold air uh, through that unit to cool it off completely and you are good to go. You are uh, back in business for another 100 rounds. So one thing that I wish I would have done sooner was actually get some of these aluminum reloading trays, all right? Especially in the bigger cartridges, like my like 7 Psalm 3 and WinMag, there's a lot of heat getting put into that cartridge and you can actually start to melt these uh, plastic reloading trays. So I uh, picked up some uh, aluminum ones and they have been pretty clutch. But let me see if you can actually see this. Yeah, if you get a plastic reloading tray too hot, what you end up with is a perfect mold of the uh, head stamp on that case. All right, we're still going. Everything has been rocking along, and this is pretty exciting, man. This is a really good recipe. Look at that. Still just crushing right at 44. This might be the most consistent batch of ammo that I've ever loaded as far as neck tension seating pressure. Look at that, these are just on the money, 44 PSI. All right, so we're gonna try something out here and I have not tried this yet, so we're gonna see what happens together. I just took a once fired case from that ammo that I just loaded. I've already fired some rounds. This is a fired round that I have not annealed again since that that firing. So we're going to see what the difference is in seating pressure for a once fired case after annealing. Ooh. Yeah, that's not even going. That's not going anywhere. Alright, just for GP, we took that same case and I went over and I nailed it real quick and we're going to see if the results are any different uh, after that. Oh, ho, ho, look at there. We got something. Alright.
a few questions about the build itself. Some of you guys took to it like a fish to water and uh, some other guys couldn't quite figure it out. Uh, so I'm just going to show you this real quick. All it is is just a three prong extension cord, right? You got both ends here. All you're doing is cutting into it and splicing this timer into this extension cord. Okay. This timer comes with a wiring diagram for two different ways. It'll tell you how to wire it with a separate 12 volt power source and it tells you how to wire it with the same plug, right? With that same 120 volt source. Another person has told me that that wiring diagram with the 120 power source is wrong, which makes sense to me because when I tried it, I couldn't get it to work. Obviously that would be the easiest way to do it, but I couldn't get it to work. I'm not an electrical engineer. I thought I was screwing something up. So I tried the 12 volt way and it just worked. So apparently the diagram is wrong when they try to tell you how to power everything with one plug. But some of the questions about the inside of here are what are these uh, little adapters? This is just a quick disconnect. That's all it is. It just, it's just something easy that I could plug in and unplug and I didn't actually have to cut this 12 volt power source, source right here. So that's all that is. It could I could cut this tip off, take these two wires, put them directly into the unit to power it and it'd be the same thing. All right, but that's all it is. The extension cord, the blue or the green and white wires stay together untouched. All you're doing is splicing into that black wire and you're putting that black wire in those two little slots right in the back of the unit there. All right, that does it for me. If I left anything out, I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments. Hopefully I was able to save you some money on this build and answer a few questions.